Welcome, I want to talk today about a technique called back of visual words, which is an approach for finding similar images, for example, in a database of images. And that's a frequently used problem in computer vision, photogrammetry or robotics when you want to make data associations. You, for example, want to find two images of the same place in order to do place recognition. Or you want to find similar images in a database given a query image. These are all tasks where you want to look for similar images, similar data items. And back of words is a popular technique that can be used in order to do that. Um, so as a preparation for this lecture, you may want to start this five minute summary of this um, whole lecture explaining back of visual words very briefly. If not, just lean back and enjoy what I'm going to present here. So what's the back of visual words? Um, it's a technique that can be used for finding similar images in a database, either um, images among each other in the database or with respect to a given query image. So let's say you put into a database a large set of images and you want to find um, an image in your database that is similar to one query image. And then the question is, how can you search for that? And backup visual words gives you an possibility so that you can put in this image as your search query and bring back um, or return images that look similar to the one you queried for. So that's similar to what's, let's say, Google image search, for example, where you can drag and drop an image to the search window and it will return you similar images. And backup words is one approach to do that. Um, additionally, backup words um, also provides a quite compact representation of the image so that in the end you don't actually need to store the image it's sufficient to um, store a compact representation, which, as we will see, will just be a histogram um, of certain feature occurrences, uh, and you can do all the comparisons based on those histograms. So you may wonder about the word bag of words. Why word? And the reason for this is that this is a technique which stems from the text mining community. So if you have a large number of text documents and you want to find text documents that are similar to a query document or you want to group those documents into different types of documents, let's say legal documents or reports with respect to um, trade aspects or um, papers from robotics or papers from a different discipline. So whatever it is, you want to group those documents or you want to look for similar documents. So it's, as you know, a common technique or a common problem um, in libraries or in searching for relevant documents. For example, if you have a paper and you want to look for papers that are similar to your paper when you do your related work study. Um, and so the bag of words, how it's originally called in the text mining community, is a technique that um, reduces those documents to word occurrences. And then based on the distribution of word occurrences, identifies similar documents. So basically you say, if I have documents where certain words appear with similar frequencies, those documents are probably similar. And back of visual words does that concept, but transferred from text documents to images. Also in terms of text documents, so if you uh, know the setup that we use to store our papers, our paper repository, um, where you have basically a summary of a paper, um, uh, some images and kind of the title and things like this of the paper, there's a button here, look for similar papers. And if you press that button, what the database will do, it will return you papers um, and the returned papers will be similar to the data, to the paper where you pressed that button. And it does so by looking into certain words and simply checks how often do those individual words actually occur in my day in all the documents. And then it builds um, a distribution of word occurrences over all those papers and will return those papers which are most similar to the one you used as your query. And that's basically the idea of the back of words approach. And we will now translate that to a bag of visual words. So consider you have an image of an object like this illustration over here. We can actually break down this image into small, let's call them components or small patches or regions or features and treat those small regions as our words. So for example, we can take this image, we can break it down into small sub images and keep those sub images as my bag of words. So as my set of words, counting how often do those parts appear. So for example, here I have a patch which shows the eye of a person, so this eye over here, 
And maybe this thing actually appears twice approximately because a person has two eyes, so this would get a count of two. And other local patches may appear also multiple times or similar looking patches multiple times in an image. And this I can use in order to generate my distribution. So the first thing I do, I turn my um, pixel information into visual words. And how Back of Visual Words does this, it uses features on feature descriptors, like those we have discussed here, like SIF features, for example, um, could be one option to do this. So we break down our image into independent features and then just consider those features in order to represent the image. Here again, these are local patches just as an illustration because it's easier to visualize it in that way. What we also need is to say, okay, which of those words or visual words or image patches or features are actually um, good for making, uh, for describing those images. So I kind of need a dictionary. Similar to, let's say, the Oxford English Dictionary, which describes which words are allowed in English, English language, the visual dictionary tells us which features are allowed for describing those images. So what we need is we need kind of a code book or a visual dictionary which tells us what are the allowed words. What are the words we want to take into account in our approach here. And so they are, let's say, some parts. You can see some of those um, fraction or um, su sub images stem from these face example. Others could include bikes and others may include music instruments. Just as a small example. So there's a large variety of words that you need to define or to have um, a wide coverage of, let's say, images you can cover. And so you need to have some kind of these dictionaries. And then this dictionary defines the words which will be considered the kind of the allowed words for our comparisons. And then, as I said, I can actually take different images as inputs and then can compute how often do the individual features or the individual visual words actually appear in those images. And so this image would have a statistics which looks like this. This image would have a histogram which looks like this. And um, the music instrument um, will have a distribution which roughly looks like this. So here we have our visual words, our dictionary words. So all the allowed words, the whole dictionary sits here on the x-axis of the histograms. And the y-axis basically counts how often do those visual words appear in that image. And what the back of words approach then does, it simply takes those histograms and basically forgets about the image information and then says, how, do I, how can I make the decision if two images are similar? And it just does it by comparing those histograms. So you're basically comparing the distribution of visual words that appear in your images. So, and then you will say, okay, if this distribution, similar to this distribution, yes or no, with some form of um, distance metric or similarity, and then you can say, yes, these images are probably similar because their histograms are similar, because their distribution of visual words is similar. And this makes them potentially similar. So that in the end, when querying for similar images in your database, you only need to compare those histograms. And that was kind of a brief summary how back of visual words looks like or operates. So let's dive a little bit deeper in, uh, into that and see how that works for our data. So let's say the first step is we want to turn the images that we have into those histograms of feature occurrences. So let's say this is an image. This was an image recorded um, uh, in a car where you had a camera mounted in a car driving around in order to solve visual place recognition tasks. So you want to go drive around with your car under on different days, different weather conditions, for example, <clears throat> and you drive through a city, in this example that was in Freiburg, and you are taking images and when you're there another time, you want to be able to localize in the other database of images. So you take your current camera images, you query your database, do you have images which look similar to the image that I see right now, so that we then can run a place recognition and see, okay, we should be in the same place, then image number, whatever, 128 in my original sequence. And in order to do this, I want to use a back of words approach and the first thing we need to do is we need to turn that image into my histogram of visual words. So again here on the x-axis of the histogram are the allowed visual words. Now just basically for illustration purposes here shown as different colors but of course in practice this are unlikely to be color values um, and this is the count. So the blue wing would appear one, two, three, four, five times. The red uh, visual word would appear twice. The green one once and uh, the yellow and the orange one would not appear at all. And kind of this transition 
from the image to the histogram is the first step that we need to do. So consider how does it work? We have our original input image and what we typically do is we extract visual features. And we can run any type of feature descriptor uh, or feature computation that we, um, that we have in our kind of toolbox. Um, let's say SIF features, kind of one of the standard choices for features. So we can run our SIF feature detector um, on, on these images, which computes the key points, so the location where a feature will be computed and uh, so what's a kind of a locally distinct point and then the descriptor computed by taking into account the local neighborhood of that key point. So if we run our standard SIFT approach, again this runs on a black-white image, therefore we have black-white here, and we see those circles and those lines over here. And as a reminder, this was the way we were visualizing the key points. So the center of the circle is a key point location, um, the line over here um, shows you the orientation of your key point and the size of the circle was basically telling you at which scale um, this feature was detected. So these are now the raw SIFT features that are extracted from the image, so locally distinct points. And what we then need to do is we need to reduce those features to visual verts. So um, the reason for this is not every feature will turn into an own visual vert, otherwise we would have for every feature detection an own visual vert. So the, the visual verts we, we are considering is just a small number of all potential um, visual features. So you can see this is every vert represents uh, a set of similarly looking features and they are defined through the dictionary. For a moment let's assume we have a dictionary and in a few minutes I will tell you how to compute that dictionary. So that means we take those feature descriptors and we will assign them to the closest word in our dictionary. And maybe we have a maximum distance that we allow for that, otherwise we say this feature is simply not represented by any visual word. And just for illustration purposes, I now use these red, blue and um, green boxes, for example, that we say in this example we have three visual words which appear. So there's a blue visual word here, here and here. This is a green visual word and these are two red visual words. And so I'm kind of mapping my SIFT features or the feature that I've computed onto those visual words here just illustrated by a few um, colored boxes just for illustration purposes. And once I have this assignment I can actually forget about the image. I don't need to consider the image anymore. So what I can return I can just say okay an image is just something which has visual word occurrences like this example over here. So again this doesn't mean um, that um, we have those colored boxes over here. It just means that visual words appear in an image and I don't care about the actual pixel values anymore. I actually can forget them and it will just continue working with my visual words. And then I'm simply doing counting. So blue appears one, two, three, four, five times. Green appears once and red appears twice. So it will be the histogram that I've shown for illustration purposes before. Um, here is my blue visual word which has a count of five, red one with a count of two, green one with a count of one, and the other twos did not appear. So we have a histogram 52100. So this histogram basically can be expressed by a vector saying 52100. And of course here the order matters and the order is defined through the visual words and it must be the same for all images. Right? So I can then, with this approach, I can turn every image into a histogram, so in the end it's a sequence of counts which tell me how often do the individual visual words appear in that single image. And that's how we turn images into such histograms. Okay, in order to do that, what we need, we need our, of course, uh, feature descriptor that we want to use, so let's say SIF for example, and we need to define our visual words, our dictionary. So where do the visual words come from? Who tells us which visual words we should use? So again, the dictionary is important in here because it basically is a definition of the words that are allowed or the visual words that are considered for our comparisons. If we have a feature which is not represented as a visual word in the dictionary, this feature will simply be ignored. It simply will not matter. So the visual word, the visual dictionary and the visual words need to remain fixed because they describe kind of the words we are allowed to use and they define the x-axis of the histogram. So this is a dictionary. 
So the dictionary is basically and has an order, say blue is word number one in my dictionary, red is word number two in my dictionary, green is word number three in my dictionary, and so on and so forth. So the allowed visual words and the order in which I consider them in the histograms is um, defined through the dictionary and is fixed as something that should not change. So the dictionary can be learned once, for example, giving a large database, you can build a dictionary out of that for that database. Um, and if you have a very diverse database, very large database, you may come up with a representative dictionary. But this dictionary then needs to remain fixed. You don't change that. And this dictionary, again, is typically learned from data. So it's not something that we specify by hand. We learn that from data. And the question is, how can we actually learn that? So how does that work? So I, in the next few minutes, want to dive a little bit deeper into how I can actually obtain this dictionary of visual words. So let's say we have a training data set. This can be my database I want to work on if this database is fixed, or it can be just a large uh, collection of images taking or showing a large variety of different images um, in that database. Um, let's say a million of images, and they all are recorded with different cameras from different setups, um, showing completely different scenes, um, small objects, large objects, landscape scenes, humans, you name it. And um, this would be a diverse, diverse data set that you could use for learning your dictionary. If you want to apply that to a very specific application like place recognition um, with images taken from a car um, in a certain city, then you will of course only take images recorded from a car in a certain city, in this city, um, under similar conditions, because then you would have a dictionary which is more specific to the task that you actually want to solve. So your training data set should be somehow related to the data set or to the type of data you will be working on later on. Um, the important thing to notice here when I talk about training data set is that this is what we will do in a second is an unsupervised approach. So you do not need to provide manual labels, for example, for something. It's an unsupervised training uh, or an unsupervised approach where you just need to put in the images and the approach will sort that out on its own. Okay, so how does it work? We take our database of images, let's say those example images here um, taken from the car data set, and we extract visual features, for example, SIF features out of that. So every image will turn into a set of SIF features, let's say 500 SIF features for image number one, 200 SIF features for image number three, 700 for image number eight, and so on and so forth. So we will collect a large set of those SIF features. So this represents always one single SIF feature. So we get thousands or 10,000 or 100,000 or millions of those um, feature vectors, just depending on how many images we have and which parameters we use for our descriptor. So what we have from these thousands or 10,000 or 100,000 of images, we will get a number of SIF features, let's say roughly 500 times more than images, gives you a good approximation, roughly 500 SIF features per image, for example. And then you have a large number of those features. And these are not yet visual words, these are just visual features that appear in my training data set. So this is a vector, so in case of SIF, this can be a 128 dimensional um, vector because this is the, the descriptor that um, SIF will generate. If you take other features, descriptors, then they may be of smaller dimensions, let's say 64 dimensional vectors, for example, or 32. That simply depends on what your descriptor returns. And so those vectors are nothing else than that ve data points in some high dimensional space, in this high dimensional feature space. So all these vectors are just kind of points in this 128 dimensional space. So I can't visualize a 128 dimensional space well, so let's stick with this, uh, let's say, illustration of a three dimensional space, and even that's hard to visualize in 2D. So, um, but I think you get it. So these are data points which are somewhere stored in this high dimensional space. Now what we now want to do is we want to actually group similar features together so that they will later on form one visual word. So we take, let's say, those data points which are close together or those data points which are close together and say, okay, this is actually probably very similar image content because remember those features just basically provide a description of the local surrounding of the key point, for example, the distribution of gradients or something like this. And so that means we have data points here which represent image regions which show a similar distribution of gradients. 
can say, okay, this distribution of gradients, let's make, turn that into a visual word. And so we can say, okay, those two data, three data points we use and take, make one visual word out of this, let's say taking the mean of those three data points, for example. And we do the same for those over here and for those guys over here. So that we can actually group them here, illustrated by color. This is kind of the red um, data points. All the red ones are combined together to then form one red visual word and the same holds for the green ones, for example. And this grouping of similar descriptors is something which is used, or we use a clustering algorithm for that. And it clusters our data points in an unsupervised way, or typically in an unsupervised way, um, so that I then get clusters of those feature descriptors of these points in this high-dimensional feature space, and that I then can find representatives for this. This can either be one feature out of this subset, or what is typically used, a mean feature descriptor vector computed over those data points. So that you basically run a clustering algorithm so that all those data points over here will turn into the um, blue word, all those guys over here turn into the yellow word, these ones over here into the green word, and so on and so forth. And it's a standard clustering approach that can be used for this. So what is a standard clustering approach? Um, we don't have any special needs in here. We, the first thing we typically try is something like k-means. So remember, k-means algorithm is a standard approach for clustering and what does k-means do? Let's give me give you here uh, a, a brief few minute introduction into k-means. What k-means does, it partitions the data that we have, in this case these are our feature descriptors, into k clusters and we need to provide this k. So we can say k equals 1000 means generate me 1000 clusters from my data set and return me those 1000 um, so-called centroids which are kind of the the center of mass in the cluster space. So it's basically a mean over my uh, feature descriptors which are supposed to form one visual word. So the clusters will, that, that are generated, these k clusters, will be represented by k centroids and the centroid is to be the mean of the data points. And then the objective of the k-means algorithm is to find k clusters and assign all the data points um, that I have in my data set to the closest centroid, to the closest cluster. Um, and I do this in a way so that the squared distances between the individual data points and the centroids to which the data points are assigned to is minimized. So I'm minimizing the uh, squared distance. So if we use this k-means approach for learning our dictionary for our bag of visual words approach, that means we partition the feature space or the feature that occur into k groups. So we say all the let's say 1 million um, features that we find, we group them into, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 um, clusters. So k equal, would be equal to 10,000. And I reduce my 1 million data points to these 10,000 centroids so that always a large number of feature descriptors are assigned to one centroid to form a group. So we have 10,000 groups of features. And then I compute for all the features which have been to grouped together into one group, I compute the mean descriptor value, which will be the centroid. And this centroid will be a visual word in my dictionary. So the output of the k-means algorithm are those centroids, are those mean feature descriptors, and they form the individual visual words in my dictionary. And then if I have a feature uh, detection in an image, I will assign this feature to the closest uh, centroid in my dictionary. I say maybe I have a maximum distance that I allow for and if the uh, feature is too far away from any word, say, okay, I ignore this feature. But otherwise, um, I will assign it to the closest visual word. So what the k-means approach then does, it generates k words and assigns the features always to the nearest word and does it in a way that the squared distances between the features and the visual words are actually minimized. So how does k-means work from a technical point of view? Um, so first we could do it informally and then present the algorithm. So we do an initialization. This is typically um, a random initialization. Uh, for example, we randomly sample k uh, data points and say these are our centroids. We start with our initial initialization of the clusters and then we will actually revise those centroids. Um, we can choose another initialization, but um, randomly drawing from your data points is something which is um, a not too bad starting point. And, and then what the k-means algorithm does, it repeats until convergence. Two steps. The first step is assign each data point to the closest centroid. So we have a loop iterating over all our data points and assign them to the closest centroid. And starting with our initialization of the centroids. And this gives me the data association of 
data points or feature vectors to centroids or visual verts. And then in the second step, I recompute my centroids based on this new data assignment or data association. So I take, say, a centroid for every centroid, which data points have been assigned to you, and then your new location in the feature space is the mean computed over all, um, from all the features, and this gives you kind of the new word, the new data point in your high dimensional feature space that represents the group of features. And then we repeat this approach until convergence. Convergence, for example, can be if the data association doesn't change anymore, also the centroid locations won't change anymore. Um, this can be a little bit tricky in the, in the setup that we will be using here for visual verts. So you typically stop after, let's say, the, the distances don't really change anymore or if there's an epsilon change in your distances. More formally, the k-means approach, let's say we have m centroids and xt are our data points and k are the number of clusters. We iterate over all data points and then make an assignment saying um, this bit tells me um, which data point t is assigned to which cluster i. So it's, um, I return a 1 in this indicator vector if the distance between the data point and the centroid is the minimum distance. So it means I'm activating this indicator variable b if um, a data point is assigned to the, if I found the closest cluster and zero otherwise. And then this is kind of the step number one, this assignment step. And this step number two, which recomputes the mean, I'm basically iterating over all data points, multiply the data points with the indicator variable and divide it by the sum of the indicator variables for that um, centroid. And this is basically the a weighted mean, although the weights are just zero and one. So it's an indicator variable telling you which data point to take into account when recomputing the mean location of the feature. And, and that's basically it. So just as a small example, two-dimensional feature space. Um, these are my data points, and these, the red and the blue cross are my initial centroids, which are just random locations here. In this case, they are not part of the feature space, but often you may want to do this. So what do we do? We first compute our assignment, which is seen over here. So assign all the data points to the closest cluster, which is here shown by colors. So all the red data points will be associated to the red cross. All the blue data points will be associated to the blue cross. And then I'm recomputing the blue cross and the red cross location based on this assignment. So this is kind of the second step of the first iteration. So the new mean location will be over here for the blue data points and the red one over here. And then I again do the next data station. So step one in, iter uh, step one in iteration number two. Then the separating line will be over here. These are all the blue points, these are all the red points. And I'm recomputing the mean. And I'm separating again. You can see now the separation line becomes actually similar. Get the same data points here. Compute the separation line. And now the separation line basically doesn't really change anymore. So I say, okay, this is my final result. This is a centroid number one. This is a centroid number two. All the blue points belong to centroid number one. All the red points belong to the center number or centroid number two. And that's how k-means works. And you can see this as an illustration for having a 2D feature space and we want to find a dictionary of size two. Then this would be the result that you actually get. Of course, in reality, we have a high, more higher dimensional feature space, let's say 128 dimensional feature space. And the size of the dictionary is not two, as in this example, it may be 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 maybe. Depends on the size of your, how many images you want to deal with in the end. And, um, but this approach is exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you do this for whatever, 100 images, 10,000 or 100,000 images, just that it takes longer, obviously, for larger data sets. So k-means is a standard approach for clustering. It's one of the, or probably the most popular clustering algorithm. Um, it's fairly easy to implement. And the only thing that you need to do is choose your number of clusters. Um, and then give it a run and k-means will return your centroids. A few things you need to know about k-means if you work with it. First, the initialization matters. So the result that you get depends on your, initial initial, on your initialization, on your initial centroids, because it iteratively updates them. Um, so it's not a direct solution, it's an iterative solution. So you may want to think about how to initialize your clusters. Uh, one example would be to randomly draw data points from your from the visual features you have detect you have detected and maybe you can have a smart way for kind of distributing the initialization a little bit in feature space that not everything is clustered in a very local region uh, which may be suboptimal. Uh, the second thing is k-means is sensitive to outliers. If you have outlier data points or so some of the features which are 
spread very far away from any reasonable cluster in feature space, um, then uh, k-means may put clusters in those locations and we have a number of very, very small clusters, a cluster just representing one word, uh, one feature, for example. So one word for one feature. That's something you typically don't want to do. You want to get rid of them. And also k-means just converges to a local minima. It's not a global minima. So these are certain things that we may need to take into account in order to build a meaningful dictionary. Um, and, but using k-means for this type of approach is kind of the standard choice for turning a large number of feature vectors into a small set of visual words. And k-means is typically the way to go. So what does it mean? We take our database, we just run the k-means algorithm more or less out of the box, and this will actually return me my one, two, three, four, five visual words in this example. And then this dictionary will be fixed. It's not going to be changed anymore. This is kind of a pre-processing step that we do. And then when we run back of words online, so to say, we just stick with our dictionary and say, okay, go, take the dictionary, keep it as fixed, and now work only with that dictionary. That means if it, our database of images will just turn into a database of visual word occurrences. So in this example, we have four images. Um, so it's a very small database and we have five visual words and this is the distribution of visual words, how they appear in the image. And so every, all of those images is, uh, are turned into histograms. So we have a histogram for image one, a histogram for image two, a histogram for image three, and a histogram for image number four. So this would be, for example, the histogram always corresponding to this word. So here we have five blue, two red, one green one, five, two, three. In this example, we have four um, blue ones, no red one, um, one green and one yellow one, and no orange one. And here it changes again. So um, we can see that the, um, the every image is turned into a histogram. And what is also obvious if you, if you make this transition is, for example, the location of the feature in the image doesn't matter anymore. So it's, it's irrelevant where the word has been detected in the image, as long as it has been detected in the image. So every image is turned into one of those histograms given the dictionary. And again, the dictionary is always the x-axis of the histogram and the bins, so the height of the bins, tells you how often this visual feature appears. So this means this back of visual words model is actually quite compact summary of the image content. If you think about 5,000 visual words, you basically reduce your image to 5,000 counts, 5,000 numbers, integers, which tell you how often do the visual words actually appear. So it can be a very compact representation of your image. The second thing which is um, relevant, and this is especially important if you think about place recognition task, is that the, um, the spatial arrangement of the visual words in the image doesn't matter. So that means even if you change your viewpoint or you rotate your camera or shift your camera, you will basically get the same result as long as you kind of still have the same, see the same object in the scene or a very similar one. So you're largely independent of the viewpoint changes and the deformations. Of course, under the assumption that if you um, record an image, uh, a scene from two different viewpoints, you, the feature descriptor is also at least um, to some degree invariant under the viewpoint changes, which holds for SIF features up to a certain degree. Um, so, but once you have the visual words, um, then the back of words approach completely ignores the spatial arrangement and just looks into counts. Uh, what's a bit problematic is the question how to choose the size of our dictionary or vocabulary. Um, if it is too small, that means um, a lot of words are ignored or too many different things are grouped together in one visual word, it doesn't get very expressive. And if you make it too large, basically in the extreme case, every visual uh, word, uh, feature turns into an own visual word and this is basically an overfitting to one specific image and you lose all your generalization and your performance will also substantially degrade. So you need to be somewhere in the middle. Um, so if you have a small database uh, with a few hundred images, you may want to start with k equal one th equals 1000 and if your database gets much larger, you may want to upgrade it to 10,000 or 20,000 or maybe 30,000. Um, words, but um, in order to get to something like 100,000 words, you actually need pretty large databases so that this makes actually sense. So what we have so far is kind of the first step. We defined the dictionary and we turned all the images into histograms. So our database now just stores the histograms. So now comes the final step. How do we actually compare image similarities? So how do we find similar images? Either putting in a query image or among the database itself. Let's look here into the example of using a query image. So we have a database and we put in 
And we have a search uh, query and say, okay, give me all the images in my database that are similar to my uh, query image. And that's, for example, something that you would do in place recognition tasks. So the task is find similar looking, similarly looking images. The input is my database of images, my dictionary, so that the database can be turned into my histogram, and a query image or multiple query images. So let's say this is B let me by database. I put in one query image and then the outputs are the n most similar images from my database, similar in the sense of similar to the query image or images. So if this is my query image and this is my database. These may be, let's say, the two most similar ones that I will return. So how do I do this similarity query now? Um, as we, that we said, we don't need to store those images, we just store histograms. So that means that the task of comparing images reduces to the task of comparing histograms. So the question that we need to do, if this the same as this one and the same as this one, or let's say maybe the same is not the right word, but similar one. So how, do we can how can we compare histograms? And there are different ways how we can actually do this. There are different possibilities how we can compute similarities. Um, consider this is just a vector of counts. So in this case, five, two, one, zero, zero. In this case, four, zero, one, one, zero. Um, one, two, one, zero, zero, and so on. So a different ways how we can do this. One thing would be the Euclidean distance of two vectors. So we treat those guys as vectors, just counts that we have. And then what we want to do is we want to compute the, um, the, the distance between the histograms as the distance of the data points in a Euclidean space. So this would be a five dimensional space here, and this would be a five, two, one, zero, zero. So I compare five, two, one, zero, zero to a data point four, zero, one, one, zero. And just take the Euclidean distance between those two points. That would be the Euclidean distance. Another alternative is to take the angle between two vectors into account. So I'm treating those data points, those histograms again as vectors. Um, and then I'm just looking what's the angle between them? What's the angle between those vectors? If there are two vectors which are orthogonal to each other, this may be a small distance. And if they look to the same direction, then they may be very similar. Um, so what this we typically use is using the so-called cosine distance, where you take the cosine of the angle into account. Um, and um, it's similar to the Euclidean distance if the vectors are normalized, so have norm one, but otherwise um, uh, it's, not, it's not the same or not similar. And again, it turns out in the end that the cosine distance or the angle between the vectors is something again, which, is, um, which ignores the lengths of the vectors, um, while the Euclidean distance is sensitive to the lengths of the vectors. We could also say, um, wait a moment, these things are actually probability distributions, right? Probability distributions over occurrences, at least if I normalize those histograms. So how do I compare probability distributions? Um, the Kulbeck library divergence is one way for comparing probability distributions. So we may want to use this or come up with any other distance metric to use. And so um, which metric should we use? That's one valid question that we may want to pose. The second thing um, which has a very strong impact on the final result is actually the question, are actually all words that are used expressive? So do they have the same expressiveness? So does the blue word tell me something better or less than the green word or the yellow word, for example? Um, so you can make an analogy to the um, text, to text mining. Then maybe this effect becomes uh, more obvious. There are a lot of words in language that appear very, very often, but actually do not really help you to classify documents, like an article, like the. The article the will probably appear in every document that you have. And so this, this word is not very expressive to categorize documents, or the word is, or has, or he, or she, something like this. Probably words which appear in a large number of documents and probably won't tell you a lot about when you look for similar documents. So um, you may want to say, okay, certain words are less relevant for me and other words are more relevant for me. Okay, so let's make an example and we go back to these four images that we had. And if you look, for example, to the green word, the green word appears in every image, right? So it appears here, 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 here. So if I have get a new image and I say the green word occurs, it doesn't really help me to narrow down that I'm more likely in image number one compared to image number two because green appears everywhere, right? 
So the word green is more or less useless for the similarity query that we are doing here. And so the key question is, how can we identify this? How can we say a certain word is better for the comparison and other words are less relevant for our comparison? And so we may want to reweight certain words which are more important and weight other words which are less important down so that the less important ones don't matter that much when we compare um, the distances between our histograms. And this is something that we do with a technique which is called TFIDF. So TFIDF stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. And we are basically what we're doing, we are recomputing the bins of our histogram. And what we're doing, we are basically weighting the bins of our histogram um, with this second term over here, which is the inverse probability that a certain word appears uh, in, the, in the database or an image of the database randomly drawn and the inverse of this. Okay, so what we're basically doing, we are recomputing the bin of visual word I in image D with this formula. And this gives a new, basically reweights the histograms with the goal that more important words, which are important for the comparisons, get a higher weight and those which are less important will actually get a lower weight. So let's understand, try to understand a little bit what the formula actually does. So the first part of the equation here, which is this fraction over here, is NID, is the number of occurrences of a word I in an image D. It basically means how often does the visual word I appears in an image. So let's say in our example, the, in the first image, the blue word occurred five times. So for the blue word in image number one, this would be a five. And then ND is the number of word occurrences in the image D at all. So for example, if there are overall eight occurrences of visual words in the um, first image, this would be then five divided by eight. So that's the term frequency. So how often does this term, so how does this word occur? occur? So this is basically our histogram normalized to one. So this, if, if you ignore the second part, if you just look to the first expression, this is nothing else than taking the histogram that we have, but normalize them, turning them into a probability distribution. And then the second term is the inverse document frequency. And I'm weighting uh, this term by the logarithm of the inverse document frequency. So what is the inverse document frequency? The inverse document frequency has here, this capital N is the number of images in my database. And I'm dividing it through the number of images in my database where the word I occurs at all. So if um, let's say I have 100 images and in 50 of those images, one visual word occurs. This would be 100 divided by 50 would be two. So this would be the logarithm of two. And if you, for example, have a visual word that appears in every image, this would be n divided by n would be one logarithm of one would be zero. So if I have a visual word that appears in every image, it gets the weight of zero. So the bin will be put to zero everywhere. So this means this word doesn't matter anymore because it doesn't convey any relevant information for me. And so the maximum you can get is n divided by one. So you get log of one. So this is the maximum value that or maximum weight that a, a word can get if it just appears in one image. You can say this is super expressive. This tells me a lot. This is kind of what this is about. So what we can do now is we can, uh, we can reweight all our histograms. So we have to compute this TFIDF weighting for all our histograms, for the whole database. So I have again here my four images in the database. I have the counts 5, 2, 1, 0, 0, 4, 0, 1, 1, 0, 3, 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, for example. These are the histograms, the original histograms, the occurrences that I computed before. So, and this is my, these, the bin values are my NID, the original bin values. And then ND was a number of occurrences um, of words in, image, in the image. So in image number zero, for example, we have eight occurrences. Image number one has six word occurrences, uh, seven and four. So it's basically the sum of um, the individual counts. And then NI was in how many images in the database does the visual word occur? So the blue visual word occurs in all four images. The red word appears in three words. Green one appears in all four. The green and the orange, the, sorry, the yellow and the orange one appear just in one single image. And this we can use now to compute with this TFIDF formula all the histograms. Recompute or compute new histograms 
which take into account this inverse document frequency weighting um, of the original distribution. So I can now do this. So just an example, here are my images, here are my visual verts. And so I can do the computation, the, the TF-IDF computation here with all the counts and the green values are our result. And this will turn the histogram for this image into this one. The histogram of this image will be this one. The histogram of this image will be this one. And the histogram of this image will be that one. So I get new histograms, new kind of reweighted histograms. So what the TF-IDF does, it for every original histogram, it turns it into a new histogram where all the important words for the comparison will have a higher weight and all the others will get a lower weight. So we are basically changing the weight of those histograms. And those, for example, uh, words which appear in every image will get a weight down to zero. This holds for the blue one and for the green one in this example because they appeared in every image. And the others are advanced, those which occur more rarely. And so this is kind of a reweighting. This is kind of the first thing that I do saying, I only want to take those words into account which actually convey me information for my similarity query. I still haven't answered the question, how do we compare our histograms? Should we take Euclidean distance or the angle or Kullback libraryd divergence? And as we have now reweighted our histograms, we don't have probability distributions anymore, right? So Kullback libraryd divergence is probably something we don't want to use because it was intended to compare probability distributions. But we can still ask the question, should we use the Euclidean distance or should we use the angle between the two vectors? And it turns out in the back of visual words approach or back of words in general, people tend to use the cosine distance. Um, so that basically takes into, into account the angle between the vectors or the cosine of it for making the comparisons. We can see that if we normalize our final histograms again, then we can also use the Euclidean distance and we'll give very similar results. Um, but what is the standard choice is the, um, is the distance based on the angle between them. And what we basically do, we co compute something that's called the cosine similarity or the cosine distance. So cosine similarity is the cosine of the angle that is spent by the individual vectors. So if one histogram is x and the other one is y, then the angle between x and y can be computed in, uh, by the normalizing the vectors and then computing uh, the dot product between them. Um, the cosine similarity will give me a value of one if the vectors point to the same direction and a vector of, uh, no, sec vector or um, a value of, um, sorry, a value of one if they point into the same direction, so the vectors are the same, and they'll give me a value of zero if they are orthogonal to each other. And this is kind of exactly the other way around that we want to have it. Um, so what we want to have is if the dis we want to have a distance, so if we want a distance of zero means they are identical and larger values are higher distances. Therefore, we take into account so-called cosine distance, which is one minus the cosine similarity. Uh, sorry, there's a one minus missing here. So one minus cosine similarity, that will be uh, the, the right term. And as long as all the vectors are on the first quadrant, which is the case for us because we're computing them from our histograms, then this will give me values between zero and one. So zero means same distribution and one means a completely different distribution. So what we now can do is we can compute um, the similarity or the distance between our histograms using this cosine distance. And so let's go back to our example. We had our four words and image number zero and image number three are similar to each other, right? So they look similar. And so let's see, or there's a similar distribution of features. Let's see if they look similar in our comparison. So what we can do is we can build our um, uh, a kind of a cost matrix or similarity matrix where we have all the histograms of image 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3 shown over here. And we are always comparing the difference between the histograms. So this value will be the difference between this histogram and this histogram. And what we can see in here are a few things. So first, all the elements on the main diagonal are zero. This means an image compared to itself has a distance of zero. At least it's a sanity check that everything looks good. Because if you want to compare an image to itself, we should get a distance of zero. But what we also see is that the images of zero and three are regarded as highly similar because they follow the same distribution of visual words. And as a result of them, they are similar. And all the other values are actually pretty large. They are close to one. That means those images are very different from each other. They are not similar to each other. The columns can also visualize it in a plot. You can see here you have your main diagonal with a distance of zero. 
um, the off diagonal elements also with a distance of zero and all the others are kind of higher values kind of close to one or not exactly one. And this is kind of our visualization that we say everything which is similar is the main, di is the main diagonal is identical and we have the image zero and uh, three which are similar here. And we can actually show or what we can say is um, does it make sense to use actually this TF IDF weighting or can we actually do that without? Uh, we can do this by performing the same comparison just using the, um, the same distance, also the cosine distance, but on the unweighted histograms. So not using a TF-IDF weighting, just taking the original histograms. And if you compare them, so this is here the original cosine distance of the original histogram, so not without TF-IDF and with TF-IDF. And we can actually see that now the image number zero and so image zero and three are not similar, although they should be similar actually over here. And here we have zeros in the main diagonal and the other one is actually some values in between 0 0.4 and whatever, 0 0.15 maybe. Um, so this is actually not a good um, similarity matrix for the comparisons, where this one is a good one. So the TF-ADF actually helps for making your comparisons. What we haven't looked into, should we use Euclidean distance or cosine distance? I just said most people use cosine distance. So for that, let's try to identify a bit what's the difference between the Euclidean distance and the cosine distance. So the difference between the Euclidean distance and cosine distance mainly is that the cosine distance ignores the lengths of the vectors, where the Euclidean distance takes this into account. So if the length of your vectors matters, then you probably tend to use the Euclidean distance. If the, the length of the vector doesn't really matter, or the distance of the endpoints doesn't, don't really matter, so the distance of the, of the difference of the two vectors, um, then cosine distance is probably uh, the, the metric of your choice. And let's say under the assumption that we have normalized vectors, we can actually show that Euclidean distance and cosine distance are related to each other. And we can actually show this here. If we start with the Euclidean distance or the squared Euclidean distance actually, so Euclidean distance squared, then we can turn this as x minus y transpose times x minus y. And we can, if we expand this expression, we get x transpose x minus 2x transpose y plus y transpose y. And if we now exploit the assumption that both vectors are of length 1, so the, um, the length of, of x is 1, the length of y is 1, we know that their norm is 1, so as a result of this x transpose x will be 1 and y transpose y will be 1. Um, sorry, there's a plus. No, sorry, everything's correct. And so this will mean that x transpose x and y transpose y, they will both turn into 1. And x transpose y, this will actually remain. So the equation will simplify into this form. Um, and x transpose y is nothing else than twice the, um, the cosine of uh, the angle between the vectors, because the ve remember the vectors have length 1. So uh, this gives me the, uh, the cosine between them, or twice the cosine, because they're both. Um, of, of length 1. So as a result of this, um, I will have two times the cosine distance. That means if the vectors are normalized to 1, the squared Euclidean distance is equal to two times the cosine distance. So there's a, actually a, a relationship between the Euclidean distance and cosine distance. And what we can do is we can now make a comparison uh, between the cosine distance and the Euclidean distance to see what's the effect of the different metrics. So again, in this block here, these are the original histograms, the unnormalized histograms. Um, in this example, this is kind of the Euclidean distance and the cosine distance, both executed on the original histograms. And we can see both of them are not very good in finding similarities. So this one is a little bit better. So those elements which are equal here, which are, should be small values, are smaller than here, but it's still far away from zero. So that's not very good. If we normalize, um, uh, those histograms, then this would be the result. And basically what we have, we have a scaling factor in between them. You see this, uh, or this squared would be the, have a scaling factor of 0.5. So also something which is still not good. So this is not the result that we want to have. If we then upon, perform the TF-IDF, we have the thing, our cosine distance that we typically have. And here the distance still looks much different for the Euclidean distance, but you can still see that the results um, using the reweighted Euclidean gets actually better. And if we then normalize everything to one, all vectors to one, just artificially, 
then we would actually get very, very similar results. Um, so the cost matrices are nearly indistinguishable, not fully, but uh, they, they don't differ that much because we have just values between 0 and 1, uh, 0 squared stays 0, 1 uh, squared stays 1. Um, so th those actually look very similar. Um, so as a result of this, um, as we don't want to explicitly normalize our, our histograms, if we would actually normalize all histograms, again, we could use the Euclidean distance, but one takes the cosine distance on the reweighted histogram. So I'm computing the TF-IDF and then running the um, cosine distance on that. This is what the standard Beckerford's approach does. So to perform our similarity queries, um, we use our database and we store the TF, not TD, TF-IDF weighted histograms for all images in the database. And what we then do, if we want to find a similar image, we extract the features from the query image. So we run our SIF detector. We assign every feature that we detected to a visual vert, or if it's very far away, ignore it. Then we build the TF-IDF weighting for our histogram. So we need to reweight the histogram. And then we just perform the cosine distance comparison to all images in the database and return the n most similar histograms from our database or the images corresponding to those histograms. And then I basically get my most similar images. And that's basically, it. that's how TF-IDF actually does it. So again, if you want to investigate uh, the bag of words approach further, there's again this five minute summary video of this kind of nearly one hour lecture, just condensed into five minutes. Of course, we won't go that deep, but the core material is in there. If you want to dive deeper, I actually suggest visiting the Jupyter Notebook that was created by Olga Wisotska, who also created um, all the nice drawings here for me, um, which you find here under this address, which um, dives a bit more into the details of the TF-IDF weighting so that you can actually um, see how all the individual parts are computed and you um, may help you for understanding the concept a little bit better and also does some investigations on the different distances. And there is further reading, reading material. There's the original paper by Sivich and Sisserman, which used, which is called Video Google, which is, um, which had the idea of using the bag of words approach from the text mining community um, for image-based data or video data. So this is the original publication from 2003. And if you also want to get some further information about TF-IDF, you may also have, for example, a look to Wikipedia, which uh, can tell you something about this approach. So to sum up, um, backup visual words is an approach to compactly describe images and perform similarity queries between images. And it's frequently used for um, searching for similar images in a database. This is relevant in computer vision, um, but a lot for three reconstruction tasks where, or localization tasks where you want to see what are other images where there are potential correspondences to my current image, either for finding loop closure candidates in the context of the SLAM problem or for performing visual place recognition tasks and then maybe use this as an initial seed for them a metric localization system. Um, so there are a lot of applications in robotics and computer visions and photogrammetry for that. Um, the idea of back of words is that we base or describe our images with so-called visual words and we use a dictionary of visual words uh, for making this description. And we are basically just counting how often do the visual words appear in my original image. So how often do typical features which are mapped to um, visual words actually appear? And based on this word occurrences or on histogram of word occurrences, we are performing our similarity queries. As some words are more expressive and others are less expressive, we use this TF-IDF reweighting, which kind of enhances the weight of um, bins or of visual words which are more expressive for the comparison and weights others down to up to zero so that they don't matter anymore. And the distance, how it is computed, is basically based on the cosine distance. So we are not taking the images into account anymore, we're just taking the histograms, computing the cosine distance about them. And that's basically it.